The Church of St. Coleman is actually the daughter of St. Patrick. St. Patrick's the mother church of all the Irish on the west side. Uh, St. Patrick was founded when Ohio City is still Ohio City in 1853, but there were so many Irish coming to the area that uh, other parishes were needed. The parish itself was started in 1880 by Monsignor Eugene O'Callaghan, who was also the pa who had been the pastor at St. Patrick's on Bridge Avenue and uh, he believed that the city of Cleveland would become this mecca for immigrants, and especially from Ireland. And he saw lots of people coming from Ireland to this neighborhood in particular. At that point in 1880 and 1870s, this neighborhood was all farms. And Gordon Street, which is now 65th Street, was the end of the city of Cleveland. And so he had this vision that this would be a neighborhood of people coming from Western Europe and particularly from Ireland. So he pushed and pushed the bishop, I think, to start a par help him to start a parish here. And finally in 1880, he started St. Coleman's with just a couple hundred people, maybe even less than 200. And within 20 years, the neighborhood boomed as a place, a mecca really for immigrants. All of the houses that you see right around the church right now were built in that 30 year, 1800 to 1910 which is an amazing boom, I think, for a neighborhood. The stockyards were at the south, the docks were at the north of 65th Street. There were places to work everywhere in the neighborhood. And so I think Monsignor O'Callaghan was right that this was the next place to look for people to build in Cleveland. He would set up the first school, church, uh, the rectory. They're all wooden frame structures that stood pretty much where all the complex of the, of the plant, the parish plant stands today. He would die, unfortunately, in 1901, and when he dies, the next pastor from St. Patrick's, we get a lot of connections to the Mother Church, the next pastor, O'Leary, leaves St. Patrick's to become the second pastor of St. Coleman's. Now, he's the, the priest that will actually build this structure. This is really uh, Father James O'Leary's efforts. Uh, he was a financial whiz. He was able to take uh, monies, the meager monies of the Irish, invest it, and actually have the church totally paid for when it opens in 1918, which is really outrageous. Back then, the, the cost of the church was $200,000, which today is nothing. Back then was huge. But to have an ethnic church, such as St. Coman's, completely paid for when the doors open was unheard of. He was really intent on building a spectacular church. And so he is the one that designed this place with the help of architects, although reading some of the things that we've read, it looks like Father O'Leary really had a vision that he wanted to build here. How important it was to our ancestors as Irish that they were able to do this beautiful building and it was all paid for. You think back to the time of day that it was and how hard they worked, that they were just laborers themselves and what a beautiful edifice this is. He has an architect from Akron by the name of William Ginther. Ginther designs the school and then the priests asks the architect to come up with a new church building for St. Comans. The design he got from Ginther was a Gothic design. It had pointed windows, pointed arches, and that was really reminiscent of the 19th century. And O'Leary looked at it and thought, well, that's great for the last century, but I want to, I want to build a structure that'll show the Irish are part of the status quo now. So out of frustration, he writes the bishop, and he says, either I, I start all over again, or I take these sketchy concepts and turn it over some, to some local architects, and that's what he does. He turns it over to J. Ellsworth Potter and Edwin Schneider, uh, Cleveland architects, who takes this Roman architect's initial concepts and work up the drawings needed to actually build the structure. This is the last of the ethnic Irish 
uh, churches. Uh, from my perspective, it's the pride of the Irish. It is a status symbol. O'Leary wanted the church to stand as equal to anything else that was being built in the city of Cleveland at that time. I think it's really startling when you look at this church and you look at the neighborhood surrounding it. The houses around the, ho around the church for the most part are workmen's cottages. This, this was not a wealthy neighborhood. This was a working class neighborhood. The Irish had worked their way up. Uh, many of them were stu stevedores who worked along the lakefront, down by the river. Uh, they were, many of them were unskilled craftsmen that learned their skills over time. Uh, Back-breaking laborers, basically, where a lot of them came from. And so the idea that the church would be a status symbol, that was something that O'Leary really wanted to capture. What was really amazing was the story of the uh, Irish in Cleveland and um, the significance of this parish and sort of showing the community that they were a full and important member of uh, the greater Cleveland community. St. Coleman Parish, it's one of the most beautiful churches we have in the Diocese of Cleveland. I have moved into many churches in the diocese, but St. Coleman is very unique, very beautiful, magnificent, and this is not only by looking, but even if you come down and you have, you, know, you have kind of, you introspect, you have that kind of meditation and reflection, and you, you kneel here during my prayer time, and I look around, then I you know what comes to my mind always, wow, these people, they offered everything. These people were genius. These people were talented. And I don't think really if today we can have such kind of magnificent you know, work of art. One of the things is that the design is very different and the colors, the motif, uh, very different from other churches of the era. One of the big things is that it's a gigantic room that is that does not have any pillars. When it opened, it was really a showcase for many things. One was that the iron workers in Cleveland provided the steel that holds up this gigantic roof without pillars. And then the other thing it showcased was Irish craftsmanship. Monsignor O'Leary really wanted um, to showcase Irish people as craftspeople. O'Leary is letting people know that when he uh, contracted for the craft with inside the church, the marble work, uh, the altars, the communion rails, the shrines, uh, he went to Dublin and he uh, contracted with Irish artisans. He went to Italy where he got a lot of the marble, for example, the Carrara marble that's used inside here, the alabasters and so on, he had shipped to Dublin and had the work executed there. And in the newspapers, he says very clearly he did this deliberately because he wanted to show what kind of fine work could be done at the hands of the Irish. Another interesting fact, not only does he contract with some of the Irish for the interior of the church, some of the furnishings inside, uh, those same craftsmen, many of them came to this country for the installation of the work they had made in Dublin. The colors here are very different than other places. They're um, these rich jewel tones, turquoise and coral and um, gold. If you look at the actual dome itself, there are faceted gems, glass gems, set into the ceiling of the dome. So you have the gems, you have the gold, you have the amber windows, and you put this all together with bright sunlight, and you end up with an effect that I call the jewel box for God. And that's what I think St. Coman's is in total. Um, and I don't think it was accidental. I think it was meant to be seen as a whole, and everything was thought out. sisters of St. Joseph who had served her since 1886, they started the school, um, stayed and helped the parish through that period. Sister Ann Kilbane, Sister Lucy Dragonette also, Sister Carol English were some of those who were teachers and who were here at the school when they had to close it. So it was a terrible time for the parish. That in those days when a school closed, it almost meant that the parish was going to close immediately. The sisters of St. Joseph have very 
different ideas. And so I think it was their intention always to have this parish as a mission to the people in this neighborhood, whether that's a school or any other kind. And so they kind of struggled through the 80s. For, for many years, the, the pastor was sick here and the other pastor, there wasn't much going on in the rectory. So people would come to the door uh, and nobody would answer. So they would go to the convent <laughs> uh, where Sister Carol was and Sister Lucy and, uh, and the people at the convent would make them a sandwich and, and try to refer them to someone who could help them. It may be a long shot, but a number of Catholic churches are formally appealing orders to close. Uh, I have no idea what you know, will happen as we go forward. You know, regrettably, I mean, we still have some parishes that are in financial um, you know, difficulty. We know this church may be closing, will be closing, and it will be sad for us, but we are Catholic and we will continue on with our traditions. It was a very intense period. It was very hard on the people involved. It was hard on each individual parish. There were enough people coming here that they rallied round and asked the bishop to change his mind and asked him pretty forcefully to change his mind. Uh, and he did. So that was a great gift and the parish stayed open. And we were able to continue serving the neighborhood, which was such a basic need that we helped to fill. Eileen Kelly developed the outreach program, uh, and now it, it's just known throughout the whole city and admired for all the work she does. It was, it was very significant. It was, uh, it was unfortunate that it happened, but as uh, a lot of things that we wish never happened, good things came as a result of it. People thought, my gosh, if we want this church here, we're gonna have to support it. This is one of the few parishes that had the strong foothold. They had the, the grassroots, the foundation to save it, and, and even though they were suggested to close, the, the community itself believed enough in it to fight it all the way to the top. And then to say, no, we're not gonna let that happen, that this is ours, this belongs to us. And it's, it's not just where we come to church every Sunday. There's a history, there's family, there's community to it that, that they want to preserve. The vision that the people put together and the mission statement which is what guides what you're going to, why, why are you going to do what you're going to do, uh, was almost all about uh, the neighborhood. It was about preserving the church and preserving this historical building, about preserving the heritage of the Irish people that, and the others, that, the Italian groups that came through this parish in the, over the years. But it was also about the neighborhood, about answering the door to people who come to the door and, and being there for their needs. The parish council approached Sister Lucy and Sister Carol, who were still here in the parish, and asked if they would be co-administrators of the parish. They were very happy to do that. They invited me to join them as the business manager. And so among us, we were able to keep the parish going. We got some of the uh, the work done on the building. More people started coming back that had grown up here. So it was, um, it was a good time, it was a start. So then I was part of St. Coleman's, part of the sacramental ministry when St. Patrick's Day rolled around in March of 1995. And I had never seen anything like the St. Patrick's Day celebration. and how the Irish had preserved their culture and how they were being so careful to teach their children their culture and the stories, uh, the stories of immigrants and, and really stories, I think, that, uh, that dealt very much with Irish spirituality, a big part of which is compassion. It was a holy feast and they wanted to start it that way. So they had mass here at St. Coleman's, which was just wonderful. People come back, um, who don't come back any other time of the year. The, the bagpipes and the uh, drums, the noise just echoes in here. It, it, it is a wonderful time. We always cherish the tradition, the customs, the culture, and the beliefs. Because the moment we don't have the origin, then we are lost. Every religious community has something that they really stand for as part of their vision and the Sisters of St. Joseph. And their vision or charism uh, is to take care, to care for the dear neighbor. But there's a, another label, a 
level there that comes in is, can we empower people so that they can be able to solve their own problems and, and help them solve those problems? So that's why we have a program called uh, uh, the Literacy Program, the GED Program, which helps people get their high school equivalency test, which then opens up all kinds of windows for job training, and uh, plus the self-esteem that follows with that is huge. Uh, we need daycare while we're doing that, of course. Uh, then the computer program, to have a room uh, where we can have lessons on how to use a computer and uh, hopefully after every program be able to give a rebuilt computer to people who have uh, completed that course. Because that digital divide is, is really horrible for children who go to school and have no computer in their home and they're competing with kids who do have a computer in their home. It's like having a library at your fingertips. That's why an inner city parish should not close. It's, it's the focal point for the Catholic Church to have a mission where people need it, to be in touch with the poor. And with this Pope speaking now about a year of mercy when compassion is the most important thing the Church does and empathy with people who are in need, uh, we are perfectly located for that, we're easy to get to, uh, and we have great relationships with suburban parishes where people do want to uh, put their faith into action. So. Whenever someone rings that doorbell in need, I think what courage it took for them to walk past this really intimidating building. And I think the future is, is good for St. Coleman's. We need help from the people who want St. Coleman's to be here. So if they wanted to be here because of their family history, if they wanted to be here because of the mission to the poor, if they wanted to be here so they have a place to volunteer, uh, if they wanted to be here for their Irish heritage, <laughs> or for the architecture, for the beauty of the place and the, what it adds to the city of Cleveland, uh, then we're going to ask them to become a, a St. Coleman friend for life and make a monthly donation to keep St. Coleman's afloat and to keep our buildings maintained. I see a vibrant community here. I think that that's where the future is. It's in the hands and the hearts of these people who have already poured so much into it. And I can't imagine that that would ever stop. You can't count on St. Coleman's being there if you don't support it, if you don't participate, if you don't enjoy it regularly, not just you know at a wedding or a funeral or on St. Patrick's Day. So now it's our duty, and particularly we in the church, to make sure that we look for ways how we can make this church vibrant again and how we can pull more people to the faith. As a pastor, you need to fall in love with the people so that their lives and their joy, their anxiety, their, whatever's going on in their life becomes your, your own, becomes like family. Uh, and that was the best piece of advice I ever had. So when I came here, I, I began to see if I could fall in love with the people, and, and I really did. I have great hopes for the parish. They're, the parishioners now come together and just care about one another. I think that as long as the neighborhood is here, there'll be a need for St. Coleman's. And right now, they're filling that need beautifully. People appreciate, as I do appreciate, that really this work of this building, this church, it was constructed, it was built by these genius people, so talented. And as we are here today, it's now not to carry on this legacy, to make sure we keep this beauty. I think St. Coleman is a heritage, especially for the Irish, who had their roots here. But St. Coleman, you know, when the Irish immigrants came over, this church helped people get a start on a new life. The church was the heart of everything, and they always got help from the church. And I find that's how it is today, but the Irish are the helpers, and we have more immigrants and refugees coming. The people come here for help, and then, of course, to pray and to worship. It's a beautiful community. This is now American heritage. The point being, this will never come again. If this is demolished or destroyed, this will, this kind of craftsmanship, this kind of joining of all these wonderful fine materials in one place, in praise of their God, 
will not be repeated again. But some things are worth it, and some things not so much. This is definitely worth a national effort to maintain things like this, because as I said, we're not gonna see it again.